Well, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. I guess they say it happens to a lot of us over time. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Well, it has been so much fun finding things here at Relics. Really nice people working here, really good store. I get the feeling that they really do turn things over because their prices are fair and their merchandise is interesting and well displayed. So that means it's worth coming back to because if they sell things, they'll be out looking for more, just like I am. This place has some nice modernist stuff. This is Ben Seibel's impromptu line, and this is in the plain white. You'll see designs on this, patterns as well. But Ben Seibel was another important modernist designer, and he did this for Iroquois. Russell Wright worked for Iroquois, of course, as well. But Ben Seibel came after. I believe this is late 50s. It's good quality, and a lot of the modernists really prefer the unadorned patterns. This is priced at $199. The nice thing about them being unadorned, and part of the reason the modernists like them, is you can put it in the dishwasher and the microwave and the oven, and it can take it. These are cute. This is a company called Figio from Norway. And the design on the right there looks a lot like Bjorn Winblad's designs for Rosenthal. It's actually Lotte. These are only $10 each. I think that's pretty inexpensive for what they are. I'm going to look through this space in general because they have a whole lot of things from an era that I really enjoy selling and representing and I'm not finding in a lot of places because everybody's hot for this stuff now. Look at this great table with all the legs that come up in the middle and it's $79. That seems very inexpensive because it's got really good design. And occasional tables are easier to find places for than large tables in a lot of people's houses these days. So that may come with me. The yellow princess phone. This is one of the first push buttons as seen in the fabulous Holiday Inn. It's in good shape. The color hasn't faded. People are really into phones now, so this one is priced at $37.50, which is fair for what it is. This is the Lime Glaze in Treasure Craft Pottery. Treasure Craft marked things really clearly by the time this came out, which would have been about 1970, and they only have $8 on this. You can still find good deals on Treasure Craft. Notice the way the foot is shaped. There's actually a huge shell. They were sold separately or together. The huge shell is a big chip bowl, and then this sits in it as a dip plate. Culver and Federal glass. Neat piece of bark cloth. This looks like it's original. Priced at $165. When you see the old bark cloth and it's original and it's got atomic era patterns on it, it's not going to be inexpensive these days. Most people are pretty much on to that. Combination of modern glass from various continents. Danish modern, American modern, and a little bit of Italian. The horse is a standout. $89. It says it's Murano. I believe that's probably true. And while amber is not usually a color I get excited about in glass, it seems very appropriate for this figure, which makes me tempted to get it. I do a lot of shows where there's people who decorate Western as well as modernists, so I feel like there's two customers for me for this. And I think I'm going to see if they will do any sort of a better price on it for me. I don't know that it's a designer of any sort, but I'm pretty convinced that it is not Mexican because the detail is better than the Mexican glass that I saw in figures of this era. Mexican glass has improved a lot, by the way, so don't see that as a slight. It's just, it's improved over time. And look how he stands like he's running this way. Yeah, I really like that guy. There's some Kurok trays. The pineapple is a good motif, and this is $25. And next to it, oh dear, won't that hurt if she sits on that wicker chair? 1970s pantyhose. People get a kick out of old packaging, and those will probably sell for $4.95 a piece. 
This Elgin travel clock would have been one of the last they made before they went out of business in the 70s as a manufacturer of their own stuff. This already was being made offshore. I believe it says Japan on the bottom. But it's a cute look. And people are collecting travel alarms. It seems to be a thing now. Price on this in this poppy blue color, $12.75, it's probably worth $25 to the right person. Something to consider. This hair comb isn't as spectacular as the other one we saw, but it's a nice translucent red color and it's only $6. It's definitely from the 50s and I think I'm going to take that. And then let's see what else is in this space because this one has some neat stuff. If you've been around a while, this is the old original crystal mug from the crystal hamburger stands, which have been around for quite a while. And a little bowl. And we're going to pull back here and see some haul. This is white rose and blue rose. And you can see why they use the airflow shapes that were prized in the Art Deco era and they use them with these rose transfers and then either the white base or the blue coloring. These are the Morning Glory, which is a little harder variation to find. $40 for the three bowls really is a pretty good deal. Hall in its time for collectors was popular like Pyrex is now because it's something that was in so many American kitchens. It's very durable and you could use it in dishwasher, oven, refrigerator. I think even the freezer, I think they guaranteed it for that at one point. So a very good practical thing and something worth collecting now if you're actually going to use your stuff. It can take it better than a lot of things could. These are Hazel Atlas, the Cowboy Mug and Bowl. This was a little set. I believe it was Cheerios or one of the cereals that you got these from. It's got the Hazel Atlas mark on the bottom, which will probably be hard to see. There we go. I think you can see the H around the A. That's Hazel Atlas. In the 60s, they merged into a corporation and became CCC, Continental Can Corporation, the Hazel Atlas division. So that's a way to date the pre and post merger things. This is cute. Ted's Drive-In. D-R-Y-V. Oh yes, a cute 50 spelling with a little majorette. Let's get her where you can see her. She looks like a majorette, but she's a car hop. These are very cute. $12.50. People enjoy things from old establishments that are gone. Eat, drink, dance, fun. Got some bookends in Sirocco wood here. These are going to be Scotty's, of course. Such a sign of the era. Very cute. And then this is similar to Howard Pierce in terms of the speckling glaze, but it's a little rougher to the touch. And when you turn it over, you're going to find out it is actually Pigeon Forge pottery. A lot of tourists at Pigeon Forge, the pottery has been around for quite a while. I believe it may still be in production. I'll have to check that. But the older pieces are collectible and they're cute. This one's priced at 17. I'm in a part of Tennessee where you start to see a premium on Blue Ridge pottery, Pigeon Forge pottery, things that were made close to here. This booth has a more primitive look to it. Lots of old farm style. The quilt has a table cover. This is a more unusual 1930s piece because of the patriotic motif, and that is going to date closer to the Second World War than earlier. You see a lot of this Federalist Eagle. This is a time when a lot of countries are adopting large fascist symbology, and so we start to adopt our own version of it with the idea that we are going to be the anti-fascists in the world, and we are going to show our might, and you see it in decorative items of the late 1930s especially. Priced at about $50. These are a beautiful and not terribly expensive way to see the world from your armchair. This is a steamship folio. The railroads did these too. They often had a really nice, what they call a tip in, where this is printed separately, see, and then they tip it in, meaning they glue just the edges down. This is going to date to about 1925, and this is North Africa. And they talk about how it's just an overnight trip from France. 
and this is sponsored by a steamship line and the woman on the left here Rosita Forbes is the author of this talking about the land of perpetual summer and balmy airs along the turquoise Mediterranean and then they show all sorts of different interesting scenes you would see these travelogues for all sorts of transportation lines and then they'll show you a route that not coincidentally is served by their railroad or their steamship in this case the french line priced at twelve dollars it's surprising in a way these don't go for more but they were so lovely and well done at the time that i think a lot of the people who had money to take a cruise hung on to these Ooh, bad dog you've been put in the stocks i'm sure that's not what they meant to do to this poor scotty but he looks very angry i think he's supposed to be climbing a fence but it looks like he's being punished this would have been to hold a brush, and it's made of Sirocco wood again, which is the composition. Priced at $18.50, about right. The Scotty motifs from that period are some of the more collectible, including this guy here, who's an unknown American pottery. I've seen this one a few times, and I don't know who did him. He's a little thinner than a lot of them. I suspect he might be Morton's pottery, but I do not know that for a fact. I'm used to seeing these out in Oregon at the antique shows there because this is Beaver State. This is one of the Pendleton woolen mills patterns. This one, I believe, was done at a later time, probably in the 1970s or 80s, but it is a nice saddle blanket. And you can see that it is a combination of wool and cotton and that they were starting to sell them overseas because you have all the ingredients there, even though it is made in the USA. The Pendleton factory is a great tour, and Pendleton is really well made and looks great in Western decor. Now this is a fairly early coin counter because you've only got pennies, nickels, and dimes. So this is going to be for some sort of an amusement park, probably as early as the 1920s. Amusement park or other amusement, a stadium, any place you had to make change. But the fact that it does not include quarters makes it pretty early. Unfortunately, today it makes it a little less saleable, but it is only priced at 15 and I generally do well with these. If I didn't already have one that had quarters with it, I would probably take it. He made the world a better place to live, according to this, and that is Will Rogers. Try to get the glare off him there. Will Rogers was an everyday folksy man who became very popular during the Depression in the early days of radio by being both comforting and pointing out the plight of the common man. He was killed in a plane accident going to Alaska, and there was a real psychic outpouring amongst everyday Americans about this. So in 1937, an artist named A.D. Elig painted this posthumously. It's priced at 135 Now I'm fond of telling people that generally things made posthumously are not that valuable when a celebrity dies. Will Rogers is a little bit of an exception because that wasn't an era of commercialism and he wasn't selling product at the time, so there isn't a bunch of previous Will Rogers stuff other than newspaper clippings and things. It wasn't like they made dolls and figurines of him. And so his pieces are actually collectible from when he died because it's really a reflection of that moment in time. The bass mount from Eufaula, Alabama is $59, which is a pretty good price for a well-mounted bass these days. This is neat. These used to go for more, and I wish they did, but it has the sticker with it, so I might take it anyway. These are early State Farm grill mounts. So that 1930s car, which looks like about a 34, 35, would have had this on it to let you know that the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation was taking care of you. You see a lot of later ones. You don't see so much from the 30s. This would be a later 30s or early 40s car, and this one is the sticker that went with it. And since it's priced for the pair at $19.99, I think there might be room in that. The pros and cons are it's not in perfect condition because it's got this corrosion, and that usually bothers me. But the fact that it's specific to Virginia and it's pre-Second World War makes me think there's a chance that this one's a little better than the ones I see typically. This rack to hold the belts would be a great man cave thing to put on the wall for holding jackets or holsters or such things. And it's got the Gulf Oil 
mark on it because this would have been in a golf garage. It's a pretty basic piece. It's only priced $37.50, but somebody modified it at one point. So if you take a look, the gulf, which should be in the middle, is actually off center. There used to be one more section. And because of that, I think I'm gonna leave it even though I think it's pretty cool. People seem to like to lecture to one another in the 1910s. Gee, does that sound familiar? And this piece is a good example. It has a saying, early to bed, early to rise, prompt at 10, hang up your ties. Very important to do that, and very important to be told that by this sign. I get a kick out of things like this, and I have a restaurant owner in Florida who decorates his restaurant with old wooden signs. And he'll like this because he can hang other things on it, like bar linen. So I think I'm going to get that for 14 these are pretty cute in here. They're Bakelite card holders with yes, the bowling sir. pins. Second World War troop photos. We've got a few here. These seem to be priced about 35 and 45, which seem to be typical prices for these. A lot of these are bought by relatives of the folks who went through these experiences. Okay, so this isn't exactly a Lucite purse, but I hope it's in condition because $24 seems like a really good price on a fun little box purse and it's plastic. Okay, that looks pretty rough. Let me see if I can fix that or if that's a permanent problem. Sadly, that is a permanent problem. They've put a new wire through it, and I don't blame them. It's worth saving a cute old box like that, but unfortunately it's not worth more than 24 to me because of that. So while I'm thinking of it, please comment in the space below here and also hit the thumbs up button to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button below. Also, hit the bell below to be notified of new videos coming every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for following along. Let's go back to this video. Big fan and string art. The string art boat is fun. It's starting to shed a little as they often do. You sometimes have to comb those back into place or reattach one or two. They have it at $22.50, is that right? Or is that the driftwood? Oh, $24.95. Here is a neat old iron stand. Now we see a lot, this is good because they've got a bunch. We can show you a few things. Rochester sat iron, so that would have been proprietary to a certain iron with that horseshoe shape. So that one might be a little more valuable. Some old trivets can be rather valuable. The Enterprise we see pretty frequently here with the big E through it. These were very utilitarian and common, but then we have this on the feet. This one is different. This one has a manufacturer's name on it that is English Hendrick and Company, number eight sad iron trivet, made in England. This should date to right about 1900. Really beautiful design. These were made to delight the eye because Ironing was a big, drudgerous chore for Victorian women, although the sad irons were getting better and could hold heat longer because of the introduction, because of the introduction of asbestos, which may or may not have been a great thing in other ways. This is a cute Japanese truck that we see quite a bit. It's based on a 1950s Studebaker truck, and it's friction drive, meaning that Hear the noise. The friction pulls it forward so then it will drive by itself. And kids would run it back and forth across the carpet until they finally broke them. So $22.50 is not a bad price. These are fairly common, but that doesn't seem bad. And what's harder to find, although it doesn't have any canvas, which it probably did originally, is this army transport truck with the original stretcher. This is the piece that's always missing and the canopy, which unfortunately is missing on this one. But the fact that it's got the rest is actually pretty good. And again, friction drive and it would pull itself ahead. I do like toys. Definitely tempted by the Studebaker truck, but I'm afraid I'd end up keeping it. And here's some more. People liked it when I called it pithy and here is another pithy slogan. Books that you may carry to the fire and hold readily in your hand are the most useful after all, because you can burn them, I guess. These are priced at 
95. They've got the Old North Wind, which is a good design on it. That is part of what makes them special. They are very heavy. They're not marked Bradley and Hubbard, which surprises me because they seem like their work. Next to it, priced at about 100, is this old grocery company cigar cutter because you had to be able to chop the, <laughs> the cigar after you rolled it. And then these balance scales that I'm bashing around are European style. They're only priced around 69 on this one. They say it's a bit wonky, but it's really beautiful and most people are just using these for display. Old faded Georgia road sign. People love old road signs these days. These are really rashed. Have seen much better days. But they're kind of fun in that way and you know in a bar for example that could be a pretty cool thing here's another one of these chip carved glass signs joe pardue manager Ooh, that sounds very important this seems like it's a little later than they usually are because the condition's really clean and because they did continue to make this style from the victorian era till probably the 20s or 30s I have to say, the fact that it says manager makes it interesting in a way that I usually wouldn't think when it's just a person's name. Lots of early patterns of glass and china were named after American states. This one is called Wisconsin. This is an 1885 vintage pattern with this aesthetic design where you have a scene inside a diamond, inside a border. It's sort of based on the idea of Middle Eastern design as well with the ornateness. An Asian design. All of those aesthetics kind of came together at the same time. Brownfield and Sons is the company and Wisconsin is the pattern. I guess that must be on the Great Lakes in Wisconsin. There's another fun sign. It says shop and it's got two things that look like spinning wheels, although they may also be trying to indicate some sort of electrical equipment. It's only $47. It's quite a large plank. I'm sure somebody made it for their home workshop. I'm tempted. I don't know if I can get it in the car. Here's some stretch glass. This is a variant on Carnival glass that comes late in the production of Carnival when they're trying to extend the product life of that. I'm going to not extend this guy's life if I'm not careful here. Let's see if I can get that out. There we go. These are both Fenton pieces, I believe. Imperial did them as well. Look how the crackling is done in a way where they expand the glass a little bit afterwards so it actually has a crackle finish in the carnival glass and that is deliberate so it's like they stretch to the glass. Hence the name stretch glass. Next to it we have the Celeste Blue Bowl. That's another Fenton piece. You can see the same treatment. This was a way for them to in fact, you can really see it if I come in from the back. This was a way for them to keep things going in a line while they came up with new ideas. And a lot of people like it and collect it. Nice Roseville pattern we don't see very often called Dawn. And then the West Plains, Missouri Courthouse. It's an old advertising piece, but this is custard glass from right around 1900. And would likely glow very bright green under a black light. Little ginger jar here is Mason's for Twining's tea. This was something you can see made for Twining's of England. Yellow in the imperial yellow was considered the most valuable and hard to make color in porcelain back in the Chinese dynastic era and the people who knew the secret of how to do that were forced to keep it a secret upon pain of death. So it took a long time for that to be done in the West. In the late 20s and early 30s, there's a real interest in that color again. And that piece would have been a premium, probably depression era, to get people to buy that brand of tea. Very sweet couple from about 1915 with their pointer and their cherubic child, who they are ignoring for some reason, probably because the devilish child is out in the field doing something terrible in front of them. Such sweet sentiment I have. 
I'm sure their children were all cherubic and angelic. This is a framed sheet music piece. It's a good way to get a nice piece of old art or lithography and preserve it. And there's another litho print. And another, these are all pretty famous prints from about 1890 to 1910. This seems like a very good price for a Staffordshire figurine. This one is late to 1800s. There's a little bit of a loss here on the plant, but it's priced at 125 and these large figures still can go for a few hundred dollars. Old ones are going to typically have a vent hole on the back because they had to let out the heat during the manufacturing process, and they're not going to have glaze on the outer ring, and they're not going to have a mark. neat opera lamp here. You can see it's a piano lamp or an opera lamp because of its height, meant to be able to read music when you were standing the lectern singing or playing the piano. We see a lot of these from this era. These were very popular in the 1950s based on the Czech bohemian glass of the 1880s. These are cut to clear, meaning they're cased glass. They put one layer of white over a layer of cranberry, and then they cut back to reveal the pattern that they wish. And in this case, they painted flowers on the spaces between in the diamonds, as well as on the rings and between the thumbprints on the bottom. These were done in the 1950s extensively because after the Czechs started to rebel against the Soviets, they started to allow a little bit more of their production to come to the West. And so it was possible to get these things in the United States at that time. They're priced at about $3.95, and that's about the upper end of what they go for now. They used to go for quite a bit more, but the market is starting to see a lot of them coming out of estates. I like these micro beaded bags. They say the top one is 1930s. It's got a good deco design and there's one underneath it. I'm going to definitely look at those because I'm pretty close to out of good beaded bags right now. So that would be a nice thing to add to my inventory. They also have some neat sterling clothes brushes and other things that are not terribly expensive either. I see one that's only $16. This is a set that I believe I may buy. It doesn't have a signature, but the color is very much akin to Baccarat Rose Tiente. And they're only asking 60 for the lot. Now, one of them doesn't have a lid, so essentially you're getting four. This one has some chips. They could be ground down. I would still have to represent it as having been done, but I'd probably just leave it be to tell you the truth. Okay, some dings on that one too. Well, unfortunately, I think our bargain just evaporated, but I do believe that that's a Baccarat pattern. It's definitely the right color. This dresser jar here are the Lovebirds by Consolidated Glass out of Caropolis, Pennsylvania. And it's a cute little set. $29.50 is really a pretty good price. These used to go for $85 to $100, more if they had a color wash. Look at this beautiful color. This is Tiffin Twilight. They're priced at $14.50 a piece. They've never been used. Twilight was their version of Alexandrite glass. And I believe I can show you the color changing property. See how really deeply lavender it is. Now let's get it up near some artificial light and it should start to fade more to blue. So we're getting just, there we go. Now it disappears into blue because it's in halogen lighting in this case. And then we get it back where there's the natural light coming in from the door behind me and it starts to restore to this wonderful deep color. Duncan and Miller and some other companies did this as well. It's been done in Czechoslovakia. It's been done, I believe, by the Caithness Paperweight Company in Scotland. So if you are interested in color changing glass, this is another thing besides uranium glass that's really interesting because of its properties.
I haven't found a lot of jewelry here, but that centerpiece that says it's signed Regency is interesting to me because Regency is a pretty good company and they use nice stones. I believe a lot of Swarovski crystal and Austrian crystal of various sorts. I think I'll take a look at that one. This little open pin dish is supposed to be open. That is Wavecrest, part of a group of companies, Kelva, Nakara, that did different versions on this same thing. They were all under one roof in Connecticut. This is only $37.50. They used to sell for $95. The prices on Wavecrest have come down quite a lot, but it's really well made. And that might also glow under a blacklight. It's hard to tell because it does have a little bit of a custard tinge to it, and sometimes that was achieved using uranium. This bowl here is neat. This is something called overshot glass, the cranberry dish here. It looks sort of crackled, but what it really is is little pellets of glass are essentially shot onto the surface of it by a machine while the glass that they've cast is cooling and it fuses together and gives it that pebbly finish. You may be able to see it a little better from the back. It's only $15, which is pretty inexpensive. I think you can see a little bit of it there. Let me see if I can bring that in. Or you can see the crackly. It was made in the Victorian era. It is possible to my re memory that there were some reproductions. At $15, though, it's a really neat piece of glass. And then next to it is a very large scent bottle. Women carried large scent bottles around, partly because in the late Victorian period, when they were expected to be corseted and into the Gibson girl era as well, women would fall over because they couldn't get enough breath and they'd have to be revived. It was a terrible idea, but I guess everyone had a fabulous waist, so beauty first and comfort later. Well, this is a neat shop that I can highly recommend. It was a lot more put together and the quality of merchandise was good and yet the prices were where you could still shop. Something I found, this really cool bird. It's a flower frog. You could put the various flower stems in the bottom to arrange them. People sometimes use them as pen caddies on desks too. And this one has a stamped made in Japan mark if you see at the top there. In any event, it's been really fun bringing this to you. Thanks for joining me again. I'm George the Antique Nomad on Periscope, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook every day, and on YouTube Mondays and Wednesdays. So my birdie and I are gonna take off now, but we'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!